Morning, church. I'll be reading from Luke 7, verses 18 through 36 in the NIV. John's disciples told him all about these things, calling two of them. He sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the man came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is pro proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who w wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one, whom, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is, at, is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' word, acknowledged that God's way was right, because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We, we played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you, a dirge, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, there's a gluten, a gluten and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Tonight at 5.30, we're going to be asking and we're going to be answering a question. And that question tonight is going to be, has the miraculous manifestations of the Holy Spirit ceased? Not that miracles have ceased. God does miracles every day. But has the miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit through men ceased? That's a question that needs to be asked. It's also a question that needs to be answered. And so tonight at 530, I hope that you'll join us as we ask that question and as we answer it this evening. This morning, we're going to be continuing in our study of the Gospel of Luke. And as Neil read just a moment ago, we come upon a point in time in John's life when John has his doubts. You know, I think all of us can relate to John, can't we? We've been in situations in our life, challenges that we faced, things that we've gone through or maybe that we're going through, where we have our doubts, where we wonder, is God there? Does God care? Is God aware of what I'm dealing with and what I'm struggling with? And will God be there for me and see me through to the other side? These are things that are going through John's mind. And if we're all honest with one another, those are things that go through our mind too. Those may be things that you're dealing with in your mind right now. 
And so we're going to take a look at how John dealt with this and how, especially how Jesus dealt with this time in John's life as we continue in our study in chapter 7. But before we get into the message, we need to go to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, thank you so much for bringing us together both here in the auditorium and those joining us online to first and foremost remember your son. The tables here at the front of this auditorium say, do this in remembrance of me. That's not only what this first day of the week is all about, it's what our life is to be all about. That everything we say and everything we do is done in honor and remembrance of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ who died to save us so that we can live for Him. Lord, this morning as we study this text, we, we're going to look at the doubt that, that John suffered with. And it's, it's a point that, that we all can identify with. It's something that we as humans all struggle with and some may be struggling with very mightily right now. Lord, we ask that you would help us to focus on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. To put our faith in Jesus and what he can and will do with us if we submit ourselves completely and totally to him. Spirit, we ask that this message will be your message, that you will speak powerfully today to our hearts and to our minds to help us to understand how deep the Father's love is for us, to understand how faithful Jesus is to us, and to take all of our doubts and all of our fears and to entrust them to you who holds the future. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and all things in Jesus' name, amen. You know, deep down, family, I believe that we all would like to think that we are bold, unwavering, and absolutely confident believers in the Lord at all times. I think that's something that all of us would like to be able to say about ourselves, But the reality is is that we're not. And the Lord knows that we're not. Unfortunately, what we want our faith experience to be and what our faith reality is are different. Family doubt is something that every single one of us struggle with. Every believer struggles with doubt in some way, shape, or form throughout their faith journey. That's just a part of being a believer. And Chuck Swindoll in his book titled Stress Fractures says that doubt is most likely to affect us when things we believe never should happen, happen. When things we believe should happen, never happen. And when things we believe should happen now, happen much, much later. Family, today we encounter John the Baptist, otherwise and probably more accurately known as John the Immerser, because John wasn't a Baptist. There weren't any Baptists at this time. And his method of baptism technically was correct in that it was immersion. But anyway, that's another another sermon for another day. Anyway, we encounter in our passage today John, who also was otherwise known as a relative of Jesus. And we encounter him in a very stressful time of personal uncertainty and doubt. At this time, if you remember, John is still in jail. As was mentioned earlier in Luke's writing to Theophilus back in chapter 3 verses 19 and 20. And this was just before Jesus' public ministry began. And John, if you remember, had been put into jail for reprimanding Herod Antipas, otherwise known as King Herod. And he reprimanded him for marrying the wife of his brother, 
Philip. And John was calling this act of sin out for what it really was. <clears throat> and here's the thing you got to love about John. He called it the way that it was. He wasn't going to spare anybody. And in order to silence him, Herod had him put into jail. I'm not going to have you going out in the wilderness preaching all this truth about my sin, so I'm going to put you in jail. And that's what he did. You see, up to that point, John had been preaching out in the wilderness and he was drawing great crowds. Great crowds were coming out into the desert to hear what John had to say. And he was telling them that if they didn't repent of their sins, that they would face judgment from God. And Herod was no exception. John didn't cut any corners or do any special favors for anybody. He called it like he saw it, and now he was paying the price for it. John had announced in his preaching that the one who was to come after him would be coming in judgment. And when Jesus entered the picture, John thought in his mind, man, the wait's over. I've done my job. The Messiah, the one coming after me, is going to pronounce judgment. And he thought that his wait for this was over. So as John is sitting in jail, he's hearing about the things that Jesus has been doing. He hears about the great catch of fish. He hears about the healing of the man, if you remember, who was lowered through the roof. His friends got there so that they could have their friend healed by Jesus. There was such a big crowd, they had to go up on the roof take the roof apart, and lower him down in there. John heard about this. You know he heard about it in jail. He heard about the healing of the Roman centurion's servant. He heard about the resurrection of the widow's son that we looked at just a couple of weeks ago, and he heard about the resurrection of Lazarus that we looked at last week, whom he very possibly knew personally. John had immersed Jesus himself. And he had seen the Holy Spirit, if you remember, descending from heaven and landing upon Jesus. And he heard the voice of God the Father from heaven saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. John was there. He knew who Jesus was. So what's the problem with John in jail? The problem was from what he had heard, Jesus isn't bringing judgment. He's not bringing judgment. He's not even rebuking people for their sin. In other words, Jesus isn't meeting his expectations. John may have even expected Jesus coming in his judgment to have possibly set him free from his imprisonment. Well, now he's not so sure. And this is where we pick up in the text of chapter 7. John's disciples had reported all of these things to John while he's in jail. They told him all that Jesus was doing. And we see that John calls two of his disciples to him, And then he sends them out to Jesus to ask him this question. Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Now take a good look at that question. That John, through his disciples, asked Jesus. Can you imagine what's going through the Lord's mind when he hears that question? Coming from John? The first thing that would have gone through my mind is, you got to be kidding me. I have to believe that there was a very long silence after John's disciples asked Jesus that question. And if you look at the text, Jesus doesn't immediately answer the question. 
Look at what Luke writes in verse 21. He says, At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. Family, Jesus didn't answer their question with words. He answered their question with miracles. And as they're standing there, amazed at what they have seen and amazed at what they have heard, Jesus then answers their question in verse 22. Look at what he says. He says, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, family, let's step back and notice a couple of things. First, when he had his doubts, John went to Jesus. And here's the reality. Family, the reality is for many people is that when they start to have their doubts, they turn away from the Lord. Now, why do they do that? Because they come to the conclusion that they don't understand what's happening. They can't wrap their head around what's going on in their life, and they walk away. They turn away from the Lord. And because they don't understand, they conclude that God has failed them or that God just doesn't care. And so they turn in another direction. Unlike many people today, John took the wiser course. And instead of turning away from the Lord, he chose to turn to the Lord. And family, the fact of the matter is that John wasn't wrong in his teaching about Jesus with regard to judgment. His timing was wrong. In the big picture of things, John was right John was absolutely right in the big picture of things in the sense that there will be a time. There will be a time when Jesus will come as the judge over all the earth. However, for the time in which Jesus had come, he had come as the Savior of the world. Not to judge the world. And Jesus himself says this to Nicodemus in the Gospel of John. Chapter 3, verse 17, listen to what he says. He says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Family, the time's going to come. It's coming. When Jesus will judge the world. But as John sat in his prison cell, he is figuring out that that time has not come yet. Second, we need to notice that Jesus didn't criticize John for having his doubts. Did you notice that? Jesus didn't criticize John for having his doubts and family. He doesn't criticize us either. In fact, what we see from Jesus is just the opposite. Family, when people doubt us, we tend to get upset about it. Whether we'll admit that or not, It's a whole other matter. But when people doubt us, we tend to get upset about it. And then we criticize others for doubting us by reminding them of all the things that we've done for them. This isn't the way Jesus approached this. He could have. And he'd been justified in doing so. But this is not the way that Jesus approached John's lack of faith and the doubt that concerned him. Brothers and sisters, here we see Jesus giving John further evidence of who he is to strengthen John's faith. In their presence, in the presence of those that John had sent to Jesus, Jesus performs undeniable miracles for John's messengers to take back to John and tell him what they saw. Jesus didn't say when they asked the question, yeah, I'm the guy. What's the problem? He didn't do that. He could have done that. He could have got mad about it. said, yeah, I'm the guy. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that was promised to come. 
How dare you even question it? He could have done that. But he didn't. He redirected John to the evidence that John would have referred to in his mind from the knowledge that he had of the Scriptures. In the text, Jesus says to John's disciples in verse 22, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. Specifically, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now when John heard that, his mind would have called upon what Isaiah 61 verse 1 says. And he would have thought this in his mind because he knew the word. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Family, Jesus knew that John would come to the understanding that if he was doing what the Messiah was supposed to do, what the Messiah was predicted to do, then he must be the one that John had been waiting for. Family, John sets a good example for us. He sets a good example for us and that even when we don't feel like we're strong believers, and we've all been there. Some of you may be there right now. He says the example that when we don't feel like we're strong believers as we should be, when in doubt, turn to the Scriptures. Brothers and sisters, we should look to the Bible. Not to find a text to prove that we're right and somebody else is wrong, but to find truth and understanding. As believers, we're called to listen to who God is rather than make Him what we want Him to be. Because let me tell you something, God isn't always who we want Him to be. As humans, we're all liable to misunderstand what God is doing because we find that what He's doing in our life doesn't match up with our expectations. And perhaps this is why Jesus closes his message to send back to John with these words in verse 23. And listen carefully to what he says. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Your translation may say, blessed is he who does not stumble over me or does not fall away on account of me. Greek is a visual language. And in the Greek, the word translated as offense or as offended in your Bible is visualized in the original language as the closing of a trap. And what Jesus is saying to John, and in effect today what he is saying to you and me, is that God's blessings will come to those who accept Jesus for who he is rather than be caught up and trapped by false expectations and totally miss Him. Many people today, people you know, people I know, and possibly us ourselves, will stumble and fall over Jesus because they believe they shouldn't have any problems if they follow Him. Others stumble because... Jesus calls us to a life of surrender. He calls us to a life of repentance. He calls us to a life of obedience, which requires us to change. Some people just aren't willing to go there, and they stumble, and they fall over that aspect of Jesus. Still others will stumble with regard to Jesus because they feel that He's too narrow-minded. He's too narrow-minded in claiming that He's the only way to heaven as our Savior as our Redeemer, and as our Lord. Family, in each one of those scenarios that I've just described, people doubt and people fall because Jesus isn't what they think He should be. And when we do that, we fail to see who Jesus really is. 
When we do that, we fail to discover that he is so much better than what we wish he would be. In his message to John, Jesus urges John to listen, to learn, and to submit. He calls upon John to trust in what he knows, not in what he expects. Verse 24 says that when the messengers of John had left, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. And this is a reminder, family, to us that if you look at the text and you look at the context of what's going on, this is a reminder that very little in Jesus' life happened in private. The crowd, which always included the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were always hanging around. You ever notice that? Well, they were here too. They were privy to everything that happened in what we've talked about so far. And you have to wonder, you have to wonder, if the crowd was wondering and talking about John in their murmurings amongst one another. And the question of doubt that his disciples presented to Jesus in all of their hearing. They may have been saying, John doesn't believe in Jesus. Either as a slant towards John's faith or toward Jesus' testimony about himself. I mean, that's human nature, isn't it? And so with all their thoughts about John going on in their minds, Jesus says this about John in verses 24 to 27. He says, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, and I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Now take a good look at what Jesus says right there about John. And Jesus asked them a question. Man, what are you doing out here in the wilderness? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Did you go out to see an entertainer? Did you go out to see a politician? Did you go out to see a man of means? No. Jesus contended that they went out into the wilderness to see John because they recognized that he was a prophet and that he spoke the truth of God. Jesus said that John was sent to prepare the way for the Messiah. And anybody who heard that, especially the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who were always around, they were always within earshot, anybody who heard that, that was a Pharisee or a teacher of the law would remember the words of Malachi, which says, Behold, I'm coming to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And while that's going off and being called up in the minds of the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law, Jesus says something about John that has been leaving people scratching their heads until this very day. Verse 28. He says, I say to you among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now take a good look at that. Look at what Jesus says right there about John. What did Jesus mean when he said that? That's a pretty significant statement right there by the Son of God about John. What did Jesus mean when he said that Jesus says that John is the greatest man born of a woman? Now think about that for a minute. This includes Abraham. 
This includes Moses. This also includes David. And as the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are trying to wrap their heads around that, I can promise you they were livid. They were livid. But with that having been said, Jesus also says that the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Greater than John who is greater than Abraham and Moses and David, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than all of them. That's what Jesus is saying. And so what did Jesus mean by that? That's got people, people are still scratching their head today trying to figure that one out. The point that Jesus is making is that even though John was very faithful in pointing to the coming of the kingdom, he never entered it. John didn't enter the kingdom of heaven like you and I do. The kingdom of heaven had not been established yet. And so the person who puts their faith and puts their confidence in Christ as their Lord and Savior is able to experience the kingdom that John never experienced. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the church. And this was and this is a greater blessing than John was able to experience in his life. And therefore, you and I, brothers and sisters, in that sense, are greater than John. And so this morning, I want to leave you with a question. And that question is this. Have you been to Jesus? You know, that sounds like a one-time good deal. Have you been to Jesus? It's some place that you and I have to go over and over and over again in our faith journey. We come to Jesus when we submit to Him and confess Him as the Lord of our life and repent of our sins and die to ourselves in baptism. We come to Jesus then. But let me tell you something, the journey's only just begun. I can't tell you how many times I've had to come to Jesus. Maybe today's the day that you need to have a come to Jesus moment. You know, we hear about that all the time, don't we? Well, you know what? We kid about that sometimes, but in all seriousness, that is the best place you can possibly be, is with Jesus. And so if you've never come to Jesus to confess Him as Lord, to turn around your life in repentance, and to do the best that you can through the grace of Jesus that comes through His forgiveness in baptism, come on. Maybe you've been to Jesus a number of times, but today you find yourself feeling very far from Him. Jesus says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Maybe you're really tired today. Whether you're in here with us in the auditorium or joining us online, maybe today you're so tired, you just don't know how much further you can go spiritually. Come to Jesus. Come to Him this morning. If you're looking for a church home, I really hope that you found it with us today. Because we'd love to have you here as a part of our church family at Mesquite. Whatever you need today, don't leave this auditorium. Don't leave this time together this morning without things being right. Together while we stand and sing.